Hi everyone, in chapter 3 we're talking about how what is now the United States created new social orders, specifically talking about the 1500s to the 1700s. At St. Augustine, which is, you know, St. Augustine, Florida, and um, then we go up to Jamestown settling the Powhatan um, Wars with the English colonists. We talk about King Philip here and also Nathaniel Bacon. So there's a lot to cover in this chapter. In the mid-1600s, what is now the United States was this patchwork of different cultures, different people. There were people from uh, Spanish descent. There were people from the Netherlands, you know, the Dutch. Uh, there were French and English people. Plus the Native Americans were still a powerful force. And in some cases, the Native Americans tried to drive away these new invaders to their homeland. So what becomes colonial America brought together all of these many cultures. They brought together this hodgepodge of Europeans who with them brought their own goods and ideas and diseases, let's not forget those, and then the Native Americans who were already there who contributed tobacco uh, to the mix, and then Africans who at this point were being brought in for slave trade, and we'll talk a little more about that as we go through. We've all had that experience where we're like, you know, hey, if I won the lottery, I'd do this, you know. I'd build a huge house. I'd give money to my favorite charity. I would make sure that, you know, my town was renamed after me. I don't know. Whatever the biggest, craziest dreams are you can think of with winning the lottery. And that's kind of how the Spanish felt about what they wanted from these colonies. You know, they expected that their colonies would, you know, they'd arrive and there'd just be mountains of silver and gold. Theirs for the taking. And they also kind of dreamed of converting the savages, who were the Native Americans, to Catholicism. So, in addition to this idea of wealth, there's also this idea of what we can do to make you better. And by better, what they really meant was exactly like them. So, um, it's about changing a culture to mimic what the Spanish wanted it to be. And the Spanish colonies also had a patriarchal society, which simply means men were at the top of the leadership um, system there. You know, I mentioned previously in another chapter that Native American colonies were largely matriarchal, where women had a key role in leadership. But here, the Spanish colonies are largely patriarchal, and that becomes absorbed in Native American life as well. The Spanish colonies also had this idea of Spanish superiority, and they really wanted to dominate the natives and the Africans. Remember, the Africans at this time are imported as part of slave trade. So there were two systems that the Spanish colonies worked under. The encomienda system, and excuse my Spanish, I took German. So anyway, the, encom the encomienda system was where the Spanish assigned native workers to hard labor in places like mines and on plantations in exchange for not pay, you know, not respect, but in exchange for culture and Christianity. So basically what that means is the Spanish went in and they told the Native Americans, you're going to work for us, you're going to work really hard for us in these jobs that we don't want to do, but we need hard labor and you're strong, so you're going to do it. And in exchange for that, in return for your hard work, we're not going to pay you with mere money. We're going to instead give you the experience of our culture, and we're going to let you in on our religion too. So and this is where actually that patriarchal society starts to develop in exchange for culture. Uh, the repartimento system required Native American towns to provide a labor pool to the Spanish. So it wasn't just enough to, you know, go through and pick a few people. Hey, do you want to work? Do you want to work? No, it wasn't like that. It was like, 
you're going to require us a labor pool. So the Spanish got in and dug their claws in so that they could create a society pretty much like they wanted. So Spain's first colony in what is now the United States would be in the area of Florida where um, St. Augustine is now. This area was claimed for Spain in 1513 by Juan Ponce de Leon. Now, he pretty much stuck a flag there, said it's ours, and moved on. And there was no settlement at all. But in 1565, when there were some settlers getting dangerously close to the territory that they had claimed, it was Pedro Menendez who actually went back in and started the city, founded the colony of St. Augustine, which is the oldest European settlement in the Americas. Now, this displaced the Tamuqua Indians, which dropped from a population of 200,000 to 50,000 by 1590. And in doing this, in decreasing the population so drastically, the Spanish forced the Native Americans to convert. And now English pirate Sir Francis Drake actually destroyed the town of St. Augustine just about um, 20 years later in 1586. But they rebuilt it, the Spanish rebuilt it, and they were targeted there a number of times. Usually when we think about American colonization, we usually think about, you know, the original 13 colonies that we talk about that are along the eastern coast, but there was colonization going on elsewhere in what is now the United States, like, for instance, Santa Fe. Santa Fe was a Spanish colony established in 1610, and it was established among many Pueblo Native American villages. So what happened was they were sending Franciscan missionaries in, to convert the natives. Remember, the dream was to convert savages to Christianity, specifically Catholicism. So these Franciscan missionaries are traveling into the area and they're trying to convert these Native Americans, these Pueblo people. At first they started, you know, trying to negotiate with the people, you know, here's what we can do for you, that sort of thing. Let me tell you about my religion. But later, that negotiation left and they just flipped it to cold turkey. You're going to be like us. The Spanish started taking the native children to enforce or reinforce the Spanish culture upon them. So imagine having a family, having missionaries come take your children from you. And um, so they separated children and families, which brought resentment among the native people. The Pueblo people pushed them out and actually prospered for a period of time. In 1680, um, the Pueblo people killed 4,000 Spaniards in this revolt. In 1792, the Spanish returned after a really long drought because they felt like they could use the Native American superstition surrounding drought to take the territory back over. So basically, after this long drought, the Spaniards go back in in 1792 and say, well, you know, look what happened after you rebelled against us. You know, you rebelled against God's people and your people almost starved because, the, because there was no rain. You know, so uh, you should take, you should welcome us back, which is what happened. The French and Dutch colonies that settled in what is now the United States were modest compared to that of Spain. They focused basically on fur trade. The Dutch settled in the area that is now New York, in uh, the Hudson River Valley area, in New Jersey. They did a lot of trading with the Native Americans. And they even used the native trade routes. I mean, how great is that? The route is already established with people who already want goods. So, you know, great, great to be able to use a trade route that was already developed, which meant that they, they had 
develop some sort of relationship with these people in order to be allowed to do that. The French settled along the St. Lawrence River and explored the Great Lakes region and the Mississippi River. They didn't really have a claim to land. That stayed under the control of the natives. And so for that reason, the French had a decent relationship with the Native Americans. They didn't go in, try to stake out a claim and take land from anyone. They just wanted to live there too. And because of that, they developed some uh, close friendships that would help them later on. Peter Stuyvesant was the director general of the Dutch colony from 1747 to 1764. Now, the Dutch West India Company controlled all the commerce within that colony, which wasn't um, unusual. The same thing was done later with England. We'll talk about that later. One of the interesting things about the Dutch is that they built a wall using slave labor to protect the city from native attacks. And that area is what we now know as Wall Street, and that's where it gets its name from. Uh, the problems that the Dutch had were they didn't attract a lot of people. There weren't a lot of people clamoring to get in to this colony set up. The trading company, since it controlled all the commerce, meant that the settlers couldn't make money of their own. So, you know, we'll see later that a lot of people actually took the chance of colonization for the hope of making money, making riches, you know, creating a new life. And there just wasn't much into it or much available in that regard for the Dutch because, you know, the Dutch West India Company controlled all the money. They couldn't make any money. So that meant a labor shortage as well. So they relied on slave labor. They did, however, welcome non-Dutch people because they needed more people in their colony. They welcomed other people, which caused some clashes, usually centered around religion or other cultural beliefs. If you look closely at this map, the little um, area to the right that has, it looks like it has little spikes along the street, the little line. Um, anyway, those are spikes that would indicate the northeastern wall for which Wall Street is named. So this is the map of 1660s New Amsterdam, which is really New York City. So I mentioned before that it was really important that the French establish good relationships with the Native Americans and here's why. Basically there was such low population when Champlain established Quebec in the early 1600s that they really depended on the Native people, the Algonquian, to help them. They needed the Native Americans as friends rather than enemies and so that um, fur trading post in Quebec was established in the early 1600s. And at that time, less than 400 people lived there. It was a cold, barren wasteland. No one really wanted to live there. The Native Americans, however, were doing well there. And so it was really important to the French to make that friendship and to keep that connection. Now, like with Spain, there was an attempt to um, provide missionary work to the Native Americans to spread Christianity. And this came in the form of people known as Jesuits, which is a member of the Society of Jesus, so just a religious order created to spread Catholicism. They arrived in the 1620s, and there were never more than 40 there at once. So it was not a huge force like the Spanish did. As we're moving into the English colonies, I want to point out something about John Smith's famous map of Virginia from, from 1622. So, yes, it illustrates topical features, blah, 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 all the important stuff that map people love, right? But there's something I like about this. It's more about the symbolism of the art that's included on this map. For instance, in the upper left is Powhatan who governed a local, powerful confederation of Algonquian communities. And then his position up there, he's higher than anybody else on this map. So it 
shows, it symbolizes his importance to this region. And then there's another native figure there, Susquehannock, in the upper right corner, that visually reinforces the message that the English did not control the land beyond a few outposts along the Chesapeake at this time. So, you know, we've got two very strong leaders here and the land in between, and the English really don't have much of that land at this point. And this map shows the area we're going to start talking about now, the English settlers who came by thousands to the areas that are now known as Virginia, Maryland, and the New England states, hoping for a better life. And you can also see down there at the bottom in orange, Florida, which was under Spanish control. So as we start talking about the English settlements, I want to point out something to you. You're going to notice a lot in this class. We're going to talk quite often about fake news. It's a term that's been developed in our recent culture, and you hear it a lot. It sounds like something horrible and something new. But I'll show you this to point out that fake news is nothing new. It's just a new term that's been coined to call out propaganda, which has been around forever. Now, fake news typically, and we're not going to go into a whole lesson on fake news, but fake news is usually misinformation or disinformation. Misinformation means that, oops, you accidentally, kind of like you made a mistake and didn't give some of the right information. Disinformation is when you set out to completely incorrectly inform someone. You know, they've been dissed. I don't know if that's still a saying or not. It was in the 90s. So anyway, um, that's a way to keep misinformation and disinformation separate. But so fake news brought settlers to America. There were promoters in England who wanted people to settle the United States. And for the promoters, you know, they saw it as a way to profit from the import of raw goods. They saw it as a way to create a new market for English goods. And they also, like the others, saw it as a way to spread religion but they want to spread Protestantism. So you have the um, Catholics and the French who are spreading, I'm sorry, you have the Spanish and the French who are spreading Catholicism, and then you have the English settlers who are spreading Protestantism. From the settlers' view, you know, they see this as, hey, there's a chance to maybe make some money there. And... They wanted to go look for gold, which is a funny story we'll talk about in a little bit. But So they, they really wanted to come here for gold. And they thought they might have a better life for unmarried or unemployed people. You know, it's basically like opening up your selection pool for a broader area. Like, um, you know, if you've dated everyone in Malvern and haven't found the one to spend the rest of your life with, then... Uh, Maybe you'll start, maybe you'll move to Hot Springs, you know, that kind of thing. Anyway, that kind of thinking actually spurred some people to settle in these new English colonies. So when we say that all English colonists came to settle the United States in order to get away from British oppression, it's not exactly true. There were some differences that related specifically to concerns at home, but not all English settlers came to escape British rule. Like I mentioned before, some of them came, one, to find life, marriage partners. Some came to find money. They wanted an opportunity that maybe they just didn't have under the social system in England. So um, the other thing to keep in mind is, you know, going to settle the colony was not inexpensive. So, you know, you had to have some means in order to do that to begin with. And we'll talk specifically about these people in just a minute. But one of the reasons that people wanted to come to the English settlers or settlements as Puritans. So some of the Puritans and not all of the English settlers were Puritans. Okay, so keep that in mind. 
But as these Puritans became seen as blasphemers against the Church of England, and if you see COE in your slides, that's Church of England, they decided to put some distance between themselves and the church. And so that's why they you know, wanted to leave. They wanted to leave so that they could escape this persecution that was going on. And uh, when civil war broke out in England in the 1640s, some of the colonists even went back to help to fight for England. So, you know, it wasn't that everyone hated England and that's why they came here. Okay, so I mentioned that the English also had this gold dream like the Spanish did. We're talking specifically about the settlement of Jamestown. Now, the settlement of Jamestown was not an easy one. Famine was a huge problem, and people were dying left and right. Finally, John Smith took over, and the reason he did was he noted the problem and set out to fix it. The problem was that these people in Jamestown were largely fo focused on discovering gold. They mined for gold. They wanted to find gold. Well, you know, in the search for gold, what they were not doing was they were not farming. They were not planning for winter. And the winter then of 1609 to 1610 became known as the starving time. So many people died. So... You know, after winter, John Smith tells them we've got to forge a relationship with these natives. We cannot fight with them anymore. We have to forge this relationship, and we need to be able to take care of ourselves. So the focus then shifted from gold mining to basically survival. In June 1610, the English, the English, excuse me, the English sent a new ship of supplies and settlers. So what's the problem with that statement? Well, they sent supplies, but they also sent more people. So the supplies that would have taken care of the people who were already at Jamestown was then not enough to cover the settlers who also arrived with it. So ideally, you know, the idea was we'll replace the settlers who have passed because of this famine, but you know, there weren't enough supplies again. And by 1624, there were only 1,200 people surviving out of the 7,500 who actually settled Jamestown. So I'm sure at first the Jamestown people were very upset that the gold didn't come to fruition. However, they got something else that was just as good as gold. It was tobacco. This tobacco crop saved their colony. It was very labor-intensive work, but... Here's how they worked around that. So if you were in England and you wanted to settle Jamestown, you couldn't afford to do that. You know, you couldn't afford to pay your passage fare from England to Jamestown. Then you could sign a labor contract. And when you got to the colony, you went to work in the tobacco fields. And then at the end of paying off your debt, your debt was free and clear, and you got your freedom dues at the end, which was usually a certain amount of food, a certain amount of clothing, and um, a certain amount of land or money, something like that, just to get you started. So, you know, you could continue to stay there. They also had the head right system, which was really lucrative for people who could afford to pay their own fare. So if you were in England and you wanted to settle at Jamestown, you could pay your own passage if you had enough money, and they give you 50 acres of land for yourself and 50 for each person you took with them. So you pay your own passage, and you know, if you pay passage for a family of four, then you've got 200 acres to start. And you're probably going to use that land as a tobacco field. Now, when you get there, will you have enough labor? Well, that's really important to get more people there for that and to create debt so they have to work it off so merchants start to grow with lines of credit and that sort of thing. But this is how Jamestown worked its way out of horrific circumstances of famine. I mentioned that settling Jamestown was not super easy for the English, and one of those reasons was 
the strength of Powhatan. We had the First Anglo-Powhatan War, and Anglo simply refers to English, so the First English-slash-Powhatan War from 1609 to 1614, which is when John Smith stepped in and said, we got to stop this stuff, let's develop a relationship. Anyway, um, this was caused by the English encroaching on the Native American territory. And I don't know if you guys have ever been taught this or not, but as a kid, I was always told that if someone invites you to their home, like if someone invites you to their home for dinner, you take a gift, you take something. It could be something small, you know, it could be something like, I don't know, uh, a dessert plate that you've made or, you know, some uh, on TV or movies you see people bringing wine if they're a guest for dinner, or candy or something like that. But you know, we were always taught, you know, as a dinner guest, you always take a gift. So basically what started this war is that the English didn't take a gift. They showed up on the shores, encroached on the Native American territory, and didn't even say, here, we bring you this gift. Had they brought a gift, things could have been totally different. Had they apologized for not bringing a gift, things could have been totally different. But here, you know, you have this idea, different cultures, you know, especially the English culture, the English people are thinking of the Native Americans as savage. And it's ironic that the Native Americans had this cultural acceptance practice of giving a gift, which just seems so very not savage, that the English were actually the savage at this particular instance, which I think is really ironic. In 1613, the English kidnapped Pocahontas. Now, she was the chief's daughter. She married John Rolfe in April 1614 after she converted to Christianity. And at that point, she changed her name to Rebecca. So this is the story that you see in Disney's Pocahontas. I have not seen the movie but usually this part is what really upsets the classroom. You know, they're going, wait a minute, that's not how, how it happened in the movie. Well, Disney takes some creative liberties from time to time. And there's a difference between history and folklore or legend. And that's the difference that you see when you watch movies like that, you know, Disney versus history. The second anglo Powhatan War came in the 1620s. The English had pushed 100 miles inward, which was pushing them off the land that they had settled, that the Native Americans had been on. In 1622, the Powhatans attacked and killed 350 English settlers. That was about a third of the settlers there. So naturally, it's not just famine that's killing the English. The English retaliated by attacking every single Native American village that they could. The Third Anglo-Powhatan War happened from 1644 to 1646. It was a surprise attack by Powhatan that killed 500 English people. Ultimately, they lost, and it forced the Powhatan then to claim King Charles I, who was King of England at the time, as the sovereign ruler of the land, which was a game changer. At this point, until this point, the English were visitors on Native American soil. At this point, when they ultimately lost, it gave England a little more control over the situation. This 1616 engraving was completed when Pocahontas and John Rolfe were presented at court in England. It's the only known contemporary image of Pocahontas. And I want to point out her European clothing and her pose, which is very staunch, very much like the Europeans posed for their pictures. And so the message that the painter was trying to convey was that the English were very successful in converting this chief's daughter, which was a high position, you know, that would be like the equivalent of princess in England. So they converted this native savage princess 
into this highly cultured and refined woman who very much lives up to European or English specifically standards. And the fact that she was the daughter of a powerful Indian chief also kind of gave the idea that um, this relationship was accepted in the colonies now and that um, could also have spurred more people being interested in going. It could make it look like, hey, look, the Native Americans are just like us now, so it won't be so scary. We can go somewhere. We can go settle there, too, and be around people who are just like us, which is funny because the idea of this expansion, and you see it in each culture, was to assimilate people so that they would be more like them, even though, you know, the strangers, the people who are settling in the Americas are the ones who are the newbies, if you will. They're the new people, and they're trying to make the people who've been there forever be just like them. And that's kind of what this picture is going for. I think this is really interesting about slavery. Slavery in the United States did not start out being what slavery became to the United States. Basically, when the first slave ship arrived in Virginia in 1619, the settlers did not know what to do with the slaves that they purchased. I mean, the idea of slavery, the concept of slavery, didn't exist in England at that time. So the idea of buying and selling people who would be bound to an owner didn't exist. So basically... They bought slaves. They looked at it as paying their passage. They paid the passage for the slaves. Once the slaves did that labor and worked it off, they were allowed to be free. Now, you got to keep in mind, these people didn't want passage here like the indentured servants did who contracted labor from England in order to get to Virginia. So a very big difference in that is really odd Um but at first, the slaves were treated as indentured servants and released at the time that their debt had been paid. Chattel slavery, which is what we know as slavery, didn't start until the end of the 1600s. Chattel slavery is when a, you know, per a person is purchased and then bound to an owner. So we're jumping ahead now to something called Bacon's Rebellion. You know, I mentioned to you earlier that John Smith said it was really important to develop a good relationship with the Native Americans. And after that Third Powhatan War, after the um, British and the um, Powhatan created this agreement, I mean, you know, Charles I is the sovereign, whatever, the direct orders from England were, let's stop pushing the Native Americans, okay? Let's just stop it. England saw the benefit of a good relationship with the Natives, too. So, the rule was issued through the governor of the colonies not to push Native Americans anymore. That was it. But, there was an uprising led by Nathaniel Bacon who believed that the governor or the government were in their way of expansion. So the governor said not to expand because he needed to keep peace with the natives. But Bacon called this group together, including some of these former indentured slaves, who felt slighted. You know, they were there. I mean, they were there against their will, but now they had their freedom and they felt like, you know, they had been, they were being halted again, you know, obstacle after obstacle. So Bacon saw the natives as an obstacle to prosperity. So Bacon's group attacked the Susquehannock and then burned Jamestown in rebellion. Some of those rebels were actually executed but Bacon, before he could be executed, died of dysentery. What a way to go. In terms of Puritan New England, 
Chesapeake Bay was the first area to be settled by the Puritans, and the second was New England. New England was largely Puritan starting in the 1630s. Now, the Puritans wanted to change uh, parts of the Church of England since the late 1500s. They wanted to purify the Church of England to get rid of its remaining Catholic elements. So when you hear Puritan, th that term actually at some point had been used kind of negatively, but it came to represent this religious movement to get rid of all elements of Catholicism that still remained in Protestantism. Puritan leaders were educated. They were overlooked by the king for roles because of their church values and largely came from wealthy families. That's why they left. They had their education. They could have been uh, in service of the king, but because of this whole idea of purifying the Church of England, they wanted to get rid of every element of Catholicism. Um, they, they wanted a new start. They wanted to get away. So... Um, some of these people were very wealthy as well, so they had no problem paying their way in order to get to the new world and this new colony. John Winthrop was the governor of Massachusetts Bay Colony. He was a Puritan, and like many of the other Puritans who settled the United States, or what would become the United States, he was very wealthy. So when he came here, along with his group of Puritans, their goal was not to establish religious freedom for all. They just wanted to do what they wanted to do without fear of persecution. So it wasn't like, you know, we want a nation where everyone's free to practice what they want to practice. It wasn't like that at all. It was, we want to go where we can practice what we want to practice. So the idea that English settlers came and made this grand journey to the original 13 colonies in order to create the system of openness just wasn't exactly accurate. I mean, that outlook is not 100% true. They all came for their own reasons, and after getting here and being here for some time, then they started kind of working together to develop how are we going to do this as a country. Okay, I'm not sure where I've heard this term exactly, but it's, it's appropriate for the Puritans. They were fun suckers. They sucked all the fun out of everything that was popular in English culture at the time. The Puritans did not like bear baiting, which was chaining up a bear and letting dogs attack it for, you know, fun and entertainment. And they wanted an end to the theater, which they called a place of decadence, and they wanted to censor it. To stifle the Puritans, King James had a new version of the Bible printed to focus less on Calvinism, which placed God's authority above the monarch. So the King James version of the Bible focused on the majesty of kings. It was published in 1611 and is largely still used today. So in the Puritan culture, the young people were expected to work. They were expected to work at whatever their calling was. Whether it was homemaking, sewing, cheese making, milking, um, farming, a business of some sort, all family members were expected to work to run the home, the farm, the business. So whether you were working to just keep house clean or to take care of children in the family, whatever, everyone had a role and they were all expected to work. Now, the Puritans developed a great workforce, obviously one, because of this work ethic, but two, they refused to allow immigrants into their settlements. We talked about how New York allowed many immigrants and uh, accepted many different cultures in. New England towns of Puritan settlement did not, which developed, it made sure that there were jobs for everyone. So developed a good, strong workforce and strong trade principles as well. So the first Puritan colony was Plymouth, which you've all heard of by now, I'm sure, in 1620. The Pilgrims were the first group of Puritans to make their way across the Atlantic. That's what Pilgrim is. I mean, it's someone who takes a voyage, a maiden voyage. So um, the Pilgrims 
started the, per the first Puritanist colony. The Pilgrims insisted on strict separation from the Church of England, as we've already mentioned. Now, in order to get away from this uh, church issue previously, they first went to the Dutch Republic for religious freedom, but they worried that the kids that they had were losing their culture among the Dutch. So they wanted to go somewhere else where they could not only um, practice what they wanted religious-wise, but they could enforce their own culture and reinforce it by not allowing immigrants into their settlements. So they came to the New World, which later became the United States, to develop this utopian society based on their cultural desires. And in 1620, Governor William Bradford of the Plymouth Settlement and 40 others signed a religious rationale for colonization called the Mayflower Impact, and it included the ideals and ideas of what they wanted in the community. They wanted a communal society where everyone pitched in and everyone worked together. Under the leadership of John Winthrop, its governor, the Massachusetts Bay Colony was made up of a larger group of Puritans. There were families with children of all ages and university-trained ministers. So their idea, their goal, was to create a model of a reformed Protestantism and to help spread Christianity. And the symbol, on their symbol, there's a phrase that says, come over and help us. We're going to look at that on the next slide. On the right, you have a picture of Governor John Winthrop of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And on the left is that seal I wanted to talk to you about. If you look over the Native American's head, you see this kind of banner that says, come over and help us. So that idea, along with, you see this simple Native American, he's holding a bow and he's holding an arrow, but he doesn't look threatening at all. And he's actually pleading for help. So in designing this emblem, Winthrop hoped that it would call more Puritans to help settle that um, area. Again, just Puritans, just people of the same mindset. They didn't want a lot of different cultures then. But if you were a Puritan who wanted to um, develop this church setting that was in your favor and it was really your heart's desire to spread Protestant Christianity, then this emblem really could have appealed to you. So there were some differences, obviously, between Puritan New England and England largely related around religion because that was why the Puritans wanted to leave England. They wanted to leave so that they could practice their religious beliefs and to get away from the little elements of Catholicism that were still sprinkled throughout the religion known as the Church of England. The biggest difference between Puritan New England and England was that Puritans emphasized literacy. They said it was very important that everyone should be able to read the Bible. And that actually brought about the first printing press in America in 1636. Catholics did not permit private ownership of a Bible at this time in the vernacular. So the Catholic Bible would have been in Latin at the time. The first book in America was published called the Bay Psalm Book in 1640. The Puritans also believed in predestination, and they felt like their church sermons should provide a conversion story of how they came to be spiritual. So it became a series of um, sermons and study efforts. Whereas um, Church of England, you might have attended church and um, might have read some of the Bible on your own if you were wealthy and you knew how to read and you had a Bible. But um, as far as Catholics went, they were very much dependent upon the church and the priest for interpretation. So the Puritans really liked the idea of studying the Bible. So now, as we talk about the Puritans and why they came to settle America, and we know now that it was to 
get rid of all of the examples of Catholicism in the Church of England. They didn't like it. They wanted it to be pure, straight-up Protestant. Um, and they wanted to share their religion. It's also important to note that they still weren't very tolerant. And it starts with their first complaint. They were just as intolerant of the Church of England as the Church of England was with them. And that carried over into the settlements. So when Roger Williams asked if it was right for them to abscond or to take the Native Americans' land, he was banished. They did a, you know, they just got rid of him, banished from the church, banished from the colony. And Hutchinson complained that they were teaching works over grace. Now, in predestination, the idea is that God already has determined your eternity. So if you're teaching works over grace, then you're teaching the wrong thing because works would mean nothing toward predestination. So when she asked that, when she complained about it, she also was banished. So the idea that Puritans were um, welcoming, God-loving people who just wanted to love everyone not exactly. I mean, they wanted to love everyone who believed exactly what they wanted to believe. And it's important to get that element of truth as we study through here. Um, they also had a belief in the supernatural, which is why the Salem witch hunt came to be in 1692. And they believed that everything was a sign from God or a judgment from God. Now, these Puritans got along pretty well with the Native Americans. The Algonquian saw them as potential allies initially. And in 1621, they created a peace treaty with the Wampanoag at Plymouth. It was the goal of Puritans to, create, to convert Native Americans. And John Eliot even translated a Bible into the Algonquian language in 1663 in hopes that some of those Native Americans would even become preachers. And tensions, of course, developed as Puritans moved west because pushing west meant pushing more and more into Native American territory and being more and more intrusive, which led to King's Phil King Philip's War from 1675 to 1676, which almost successfully pushed the English out but uh, they couldn't quite complete that. So um, the Native Americans were almost successful in holding them off as far as their westward expansion. It's also important to note here that ever since settlers arrived in what is now the United States, westward expansion has been a thing. We've always been expanding west. This map shows the domains of New England's Native Americans in 1670, just a few years before King Philip's War. So if things were going well with the Puritans and the Native Americans, what changed? It started in the 1630s. The Puritans actually joined the Narragansett and the Mohegan tribes against the Pequot and um, allied you know, with two strong tribes. But in 1637, what changed it was that the Allies were horrified to find out the Puritans had attacked several hundred Pequot along the Mystic River in Connecticut. So it was a sabotage attack, and the Puritans killed all but a handful of people, women, children included. I mean, unarmed, unprotected, and um, this made the Narragansett start thinking, what would they do to us? You know, what happens if they change their minds? So when the King Philip's War started, the Wampanoag, the Nipmuc, the Pocumtuck, and the, Narrang the Narragansett tried to drive the Puritans out altogether. So the Narragansett, who were former allies, are now on the opposing side. It was the help of the Mohegans and other Christian Indians, other Christian natives, that allowed the Puritans to win. And at that point, Puritan writers began to vilify natives as bloodthirsty and 
hate and and hateful. So it begins this racial divide and hatred. This particular time period um, was growing a lot in terms of racial divide. We have the Puritans with their racial divide and they're writing their own narrative now about their hatred of Native Americans. We also have another racial divide growing and it comes from the demand for labor in the sugar and tobacco fields. So the English colonies answer to this labor need is slavery and slaves are transported to the English colonies by England's Royal African Company which in 1672 becomes a slave trade monopoly. This middle passage, this transatlantic crossing of slaves from Africa to the English colonies takes up to a couple of months. The conditions were bad, they were cramped, there were few supplies on board. It was basically about cramming as many people as you could on a ship and setting sail. So again, these people did not want to become slaves. They were captured in Africa and sold there into slavery. So we have a maroon community set up, which is a community of runaway slaves that resisted capture. And they lived a subsistence life just to stay out of the slave trade. So not everyone was captured, but it was a fight not to be captured. And these people were, who may have had fine lives otherwise, then resorted to subsistence living just to stay out of slave trade. Subsistence living means getting by, scraping by, doing what you have to do to get by. And one of these communities was Jamaica. During this time, there are a lot of changes going on also to Native American life. One of these changes comes in the way of European goods. They actually enjoyed the glass beads, the copper kettles, and the metal utensils that were brought to them um, through European trade. They also loved the fabrics, the textiles. They liked the clay cookware, and um, they started using flint for making fires. They also came to appreciate the trade of muskets, and it also helped inspire creativity. They had uh, wampum, which were shell beads that they used for ceremonies and jewels, but people also would buy those. So they developed a commerce based on what the Europeans might want. The biggest change to Native American life by um, this settlement of outsiders obviously was the land ideology. The Europeans thought that the land was theirs for the taking. The Native Americans felt like it belongs to everyone respected. So that was a huge deal. Also fences were a problem because as people started staking out their territory, their land, then these fences kept the Native Americans from being able to live on that section of land, also kept uh, them from being able to hunt that area and to um, use that area for agriculture too. So fences were a big problem. Disease also was a big problem. In two years from 1618, I'm sorry, from 1616 to 1618 alone, disease killed 75% of Native Americans.